Hey everybody, Dr. O here, and this is the review for Unit 4. Our first question says, the main purpose of the basement membrane is to provide strength and support, connect the epithelial tissue to the stratified tissue, join the apical and basal surfaces together, or act as a moisture barrier. Well, the answer is that it provides strength and support. So the basement membrane is the membrane that all of the cells that make up a tissue are connected to. So it is providing that support and it does provide strength to the tissue as well. All right, um, let's see, identify the following epithelial tissue and we have an image to look at. And uh, the thing I'll point out about this image is that our cells are taller than they are wide. And note where all of the nuclei are located. So the nuclei are all over the place in a cluster of cells that are taller than they are wide. So we know that they're columnar and because we have the crazy cell distribution that would make this tissue type pseudostratified. Gives the appearance of being stratified when it's not. A visceral layer will cover the surface of an organ. Is that true or is that false? Well, you have two layers, the visceral and the parietal layer, and true, it is the visceral layer that lies against the organ. Which epithelium is found only in the urinary system, specifically the urinary bladder and a little bit of the ureters and maybe even a little bit of the urethra? Well, that would be our buddy transitional epithelium. Identify the following epithelial tissue. Well, we have a single layer of cells, so that means its first name is going to be simple. And if we look at the shape of these cells, we can see they're rather squashed. So these would be simple squamous epithelial cells. The cutaneous membrane is a stratified squamous epithelium membrane resting on top of connective tissue. So is that true or false? So we're talking about the cutaneous membrane. Is it stratified squamous epithelium? And does it rest on top of connective tissue? Well, and the answer to that is true. So the cutaneous membrane is basically your skin. And the outer layer of the skin is made up of stratified squamous epithelial cells. This membrane is a type of connective tissue membrane that lines the cavity of all freely movable joints. So is it a cutaneous membrane, a synovial membrane, a serous membrane, or a parietal membrane? Well, we just talked about the cutaneous membrane, so probably not that, because that's skin. The serous membrane, these are the type of membranes that line um, the, the uh, cavities that house organs, like the, like the abdominal organs. Um, it has a visceral and a parietal peritoneum, and those are serous membranes. And uh, parietal membrane will be the one that is closest to the uh, cavity wall. So that leaves us with synovial membrane, and that is, in fact, the truth. These epithelial membranes line the body cavities and hollow passages that open to the external environment and include the digestive tract, the respiratory tract, the excretory tract, and the reproductive tract. So would it be serous membranes, cutaneous membranes, mucous membranes, or synovial membranes? Well, probably not cutaneous or synovial because we know cutaneous is skin and synovial is what is lining our, mu our movable joints. So hopefully between the two that are left, serous and mucus, you picked mucous membranes. This type of a gland uses ducts and empties its products into the external environment. So what kind of gland is that? Well, if you said it is an exocrine gland, you would be correct. The most abundant cell in connective tissue proper is the chondroblast, osteoblast, fibroblast, or the hemocytoblast. 
Well, in this unit, we've talked about only three of these. And the one we didn't talk about was the hemocytoblast. So hopefully you know that chondroblast refers to cartilage. Osteoblast refers to bone, which means that our correct answer is the fibroblast. Fibroblasts are the cells that are going to be making all those protein strands that we find in connective tissue. What is the function of connective tissues? Is it relaying signals between cells, lining surfaces of hollow organs, creating movement, or protecting body tissues and organs? Well, if we look at this one, the first one, relaying signals, that sounds like nervous tissue. And if we look at this one, lining surfaces of hollow organs, what kind of tissue does that sound like? Epithelial tissue. Creating movement, that's muscle tissue. So then connective tissue must be all about protecting body tissues and organs. So which group of terms is related to connective tissues? So let's see what we have here. So our first set of terms are hyaline, compact bone, and pseudostratified. Blood, transitional, fibrocartilage is the second one. The third one is lymph, hyaline, reticular, and the last one is stratified adipose and areolar. So let's look at the first one, hyaline. Hyaline cartilage is a type of connective tissue. It's supportive connective tissue, one of the two. Compact bone, that is the other supportive connective tissue. So, so far so good. Pseudostratified. What term is that associated with? Pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells, which is not connective tissue. So not the first one. Let's look at the second one, blood. Well, blood is a connective tissue, one of the liquid connective tissues. Transitional, hmm, what is that associated with? Transitional epithelium, which lines the urinary bladder. So that is not connective tissue. That is a different tissue type known as epithelial tissue. So it's not going to be the second one. What about the third one? So lymph, lymph is the other liquid connective tissue. We already talked about blood, so lymph is the other one. Hyaline is a type of cartilage, and cartilage is supportive connective tissue. And reticular. Reticular um, tissue is a type of loose connective tissue. So I believe our answer is right here. Let's just look at the fourth one to rule in, rule out. So stratified refers to epithelium. So yeah, it is indeed the third one. Lymph, hyaline, and reticular. So the fibers that allow the cartilage to expand and contract would that be collagen fibers, reticular fibers, elastic fibers, or myofibers? Well, hopefully you said it's going to be those elastic fibers. Those are very much like elastic that we find in our clothing. And they can expand and then go right back to their shortened state. So we have a true or false question here. And the question is, Liquid connective tissue includes both lymph and blood, blood and lymph. And the answer to that is true. These connective tissue cells release the chemicals histamine and heparin as part of the inflammatory response. Okay, so what is this question really asking us? Well, it's telling us that there are some cells that we know live in uh, connective tissue that are capable of doing uh, an immune response. And in this case, what we're looking for specifically is the cell that can um, harbor and then ultimately release histamine and heparin. Now, we did study that there are a couple of immune cells that we can typically find in connective tissue, but the one that has histamine and heparin is going to be the mast cell. So this tissue is a mesh-like supportive framework for soft organs, such as uh, lymphatic tissue, specifically lymph nodes, the spleen, and the liver. So this is going to be a uh, type of a uh, connective tissue. That's the word I was looking for. Um, is it going to be the areolar connective tissue, the adipose connective tissue, dense connective tissue, or reticular connective tissue? 
And hopefully you have correlated reticular with being the type of tissue that creates those uh, that supportive framework, that scaffolding, that soft skeleton for organs like lymph nodes, liver, and spleen. This cartilage makes up a template of the embryonic skeleton before bone actually forms. Mm. So this is what we start off with as our skeleton, and then it starts to solidify, calcify rather. So is it fibrocartilage, elastic cartilage, hyaline cartilage, or dense irregular cartilage? Well, there is no such thing as dense irregular cartilage, so our only choices really are fibrocartilage, elastic cartilage, or hyaline cartilage. And the correct answer is actually hyaline cartilage. And hyaline cartilage actually remains on our skeleton, and it serves as the um, surface of the ends of our long bones, uh, and it plays a role in those highly movable joints that we're going to be learning about in another couple of units. These cells of connective tissue are part of the immune response, and they release something called cytokines that mobilize the immune system. They also perform phagocytosis. So who is that going to be? Well, that's actually going to be the macrophage. Okay, let's switch gears and talk about topics related to USLO 4.3, which is going to be about muscle. So this muscle has long cylindrical fibers that are stratified, as well as possess many peripherally located nuclei. So this question says that we have a cell that is a long cylinder. It has striations, which is those little stripes, and it has a lot of nuclei. Who is that? We only have three choices. And hopefully you said skeletal. This muscle is characterized by short branched muscle cells, which are striated and possess a single centrally located nucleus. Well, we know that it's not going to be skeletal muscle because that was the answer on the previous slide. So our choices are cardiac and smooth. Well, it's actually going to be cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is the only muscle cell that we have that is branched. It does have striations like skeletal muscle, and it does have a single nucleus like smooth muscle, but it has branches. This muscle type is responsible for involuntary movement, such as the movement of food through the digestive tract. Now, we've only got one muscle that is voluntary, and that's skeletal muscle. So then the answer to this question must either be cardiac or smooth, because both of those are involuntary. Well, we only find cardiac in one place, and that's in the heart, so it's not going to be in the digestive tract. So this means our answer has to be smooth muscle. This muscle tissue is protective. It produces heat, and it's involved in voluntary movement. So even though you might not know a couple of other things about skeletal muscle, the thing hopefully you, that you do realize is that it is under voluntary motion. But yeah, it's also protective in nature. Think about your abdominal organs. There's no bony structure to protect those. That's largely the work of the abdominal muscles that does that. And yeah, certainly our skeletal muscle produces heat. That's why if you get up and walk around when you're cold, you'll actually warm up a little bit because they produce heat. They're big muscles. This muscle type makes up the walls of major organs and passageways of the body. So the walls of major organs, maybe like a stomach or the intestines, something like that. And if that's the case, then that would be smooth muscle. Now we're moving into USLO 4.4, having to do with the nerve, uh, the nervous tissue. So these cells propagate electrochemical impulses called action potentials. So who does that? Is it the neuroglia? Is it the neurons? Is it osteons? Or is it myocytes? Well, hopefully you chose one of the words uh, that had neuro in it, and the correct one would have been the neurons. This cell creates the blood-brain barrier. Okay, so now we're talking about one of the support cells. So is it the oligodendrocyte? Is it the astrocyte? Is it the microglia or is it the ependymal cell? 
These are the four cells that make up the uh, neural glia of the central nervous system. Well, hopefully you said it is the astrocyte. The astrocyte has many uh, projections off of its cell body. And when the early anatomists first looked at it, they thought it looked very much like a star with light rays emitting from a central, a central structure. And the, um, those, uh, those structures that look like light rays were actually the arms leading to the feet that were wrapped around the capillaries that were helping to create that blood-brain barrier. This type of a neuroglial cell produces the productive fat called myelin. Is it the oligodendrocyte, the melanocyte, the microglia, or the ependymal cell? And hopefully you said the oligodendrocyte. These are supportive cells of the central nervous system. Supportive cells of the central nervous system. Are they um, myelocytes, neuroglia, or neuroglia, the neurons, or the myocytes? What do we collectively call those? Well, those would be the neuroglial, the neuroglia, the neuroglial cells. This part of the neuron delivers the impulse to the soma. Well, what's the soma? That's a, that word means body, and in this case, we're talking about a cell body. So this part of the neuron, so now we're talking about neuron parts, is going to deliver the impulse to the body of the cell. Well, that means we're talking about the part of the, the neuron that can receive an impulse. And that would be the dendrites. This part of the neuron carries the impulse away from the soma or the cell body. Is it, well, it's not the soma because I just gave that one away. Is it the axon? Is it the axon terminal? Well, it's not the dendrite because that's the part that receives the impulse. Well, hopefully you said it's the axon. The axon is attached to the cell body and it's going to be the, the part of the, the neuron that is carrying that impulse away from the cell body. And now we're in USL 04.5, having to do with tissue repair. Now this is the body's normal process to stop bleeding and to close a wound. Is it remodeling, regenerating, hemostasis, or clotting? So we have a couple of things described here. It's to stop bleeding and close the wound. Well, to get all of that to happen, we're actually talking about hemostasis. To reinforce the platelet plug, what needs to happen? Uh, is it that the macrophages congregate at the site of the wound? Is it that a fibrin mesh forms? Is it that the blood vessel constricts? Or is it that the blood vessel dilates? Well, actually, at the site of injury, all of these things are happening, but only one of them is going to reinforce the platelet plug, and that's going to be that fibrin mesh that forms. The function of a thrombus includes the prevention of blood loss. That sounds pretty good. The stoppage of pathogens from entering the body. Yeah, that sounds pretty good, too. Uh, both of the above or neither of the above? Well, uh, I'm going to say probably both of the above because two of those answers sounded really good. The growth of new blood vessels and the resulting vascularization of new tissue is called angiogenesis, apoptosis, granulation, or keratosis. Hmm. So let's read that question again. The growth of new blood vessels, and we also have uh, vascularization of new tissue. So we have two things happening here, not just the growth of uh, new blood vessels. If it was just a growth of new blood vessels, we would call it angiogenesis, and that's not correct, because we have not only new blood vessels, but we also have new tissue. So that tells us then that what we're looking at in this question is granulation. The replacement of injured tissue that results when new cells of the same type 
uh, begin to appear is called. So we have uh, the replacement of, of tissue with the same type of cells that were there before. Is that angiogenesis? No, we already know that that's the regeneration of blood vessels. Restoration, regeneration, or acclimation? Hmm. Probably not acclimation because that means to become used to something. So our choices then are restoration or regeneration. So the replacement of injured tissue, that is actually going to be regeneration because we're regrowing those cells, regenerating. You twist your ankle while playing Frisbee one afternoon. That evening, you notice that the ankle is puffy, warm, and achy. Which of the following uh, below correctly lists the cardinal signs of inflammation? Okay, so we have puffy, uh, warm, and achy. Uh, let's see, do we have swelling, redness, and heat? Let's see, I don't see anything about color changes, so we're not talking about redness. Do we have heat, pain, and loss of function? Well, we have warm, that's heat. We have pain, that's achy. Loss of function, it's not really described here. We have pain, yeah, that would be achy. Heat, that would be warm. And swelling, that's puffy. I think it's this third one. Let's look at the fourth one just to be sure. Redness, no, nothing about color. So our answers would be pain, heat, and swelling. Um, puffy is swelling, heat is uh, warm, and achy would tell us about pain. This body response reduces blood loss from damaged blood vessels and forms a network of fibrin proteins that trap blood cells and bind the edges of a wound together. Is this inflammation? Is this clotting, remodeling, or cell proliferation? Well, this has to do with tissue repair. So, uh, and we've got, let's see, reduces blood loss. This must be clotting because that's exactly what clotting does. It uh, reduces the loss of blood um, by creating that uh, plug with the fibrin mesh on it. Okay, we have a true or false question. And the question is, inflammation limits the extent of injury partially or fully, eliminates the cause of injury, and initiates repair and regeneration of damaged tissue. All right, so they're asking us about uh, inflammation. Um, let's see, does it limit the extent of injury partially or fully eliminate the cause of injury? Hmm. Um, and does it initiate the repair and regeneration of damaged tissue? So there's multiple things that need to be yes in order for this to be true. And the answer is, yeah, it is. The, all of these are true. So inflammation does limit the extent of injury. It can kind of keep things contained in an area. Um, fully eliminate the cause of injury. Yeah, if you're bringing in white blood cells and you're killing off the pathogen. Because uh, pathogens could be creating some tissue damage, so yeah, that's true. Um, and does it cause the initiation of repair and regeneration of damaged tissue? Yes, that is the beauty of the inflammatory process. And another true or false, the question is, nutrition does not affect tissue healing. And hopefully you said that that is false. Because in order to do good tissue repair, you have to have the building blocks of the proteins and all the other structures we need in order to make that happen. And the way that we get those building blocks is by the foods that we eat, particularly high caliber foods like vegetables and proteins. You received a small cut on your hand, but didn't bother to immediately clean it. A couple of days later, you notice that now the injury is swollen, it's red and warm to the touch. Which signs of inflammation are being exhibited? All right, so it's um, swollen, red, warm. Okay, so pain, um, I don't see pain in there. Heat, that would be warm. Redness, yep, we got red, So, but the pain's going to be ruled out. Swelling, yeah, that's what we mean by swollen. Loss of function, uh, that's not mentioned, but there is heat that's warm to the touch. Pain, uh, again, we don't have pain in there, but we do have swelling um, and we do have redness, So, but that's not the answer. Hopefully this one's it. It's our last option. So swelling, yep, that it's swollen. It's heat, got heat, that's warm to the touch. And redness, yep, that would be our answer, the fourth one. And with that, my friends, we are done.